Okay, it is, uh, it's the 19th of March, slightly after noon, about 10 after noon, in fact, oh sorry, 10 after one. Um, I've actually just been talking through a, a, an entry in the Australian dollar. But what we're here to talk about is, if you like, the fundamentals as to what it is that makes up the charts in morning analysis. And I'm really gonna try and keep this super, super simple. If it's so simple that you almost find it patronizing, just type something in and I'll, I'll move on. Essentially, here's how I look at things. I'm looking to find really two things. I'm trying to find what is the current slope that is at work on a vehicle. And actually, you, you can almost forget everything else I'm about to talk to you about and say, that's really what we're trying to find. What is the current slope of um, price? And when I talk about the current slope of price, what I mean is, can I draw in a channel which captures price? Let's go and try and find one that's been working nicely uh, recently. This is the Euro. This has been working quite nicely. Hopefully you can see, it, it's very visual, but look at this. Look at, the, look at the support and resistance as we work our way down that particular fork. Can you see that that fork is nicely capturing the slope of price? So now here's how I look at a pitchfork and we use pitchforks to, to capture the highs and lows in terms of the moves. If you like, what we're looking for is an ebb and flow, a yin and yang, whatever you want to call it. It's like a pendulum swinging. There is a supply and demand in the market and we're trying to capture the ceilings and the floors as we work our way lower. So if we assume that this is the current slope as we move lower, what we're trying to find is what is the ceiling? What is the current floor? And that's what we're trying to find at all times. What is the current ceiling? What is the current floor? Now, here's one of the analogies that I, I like to use when I'm talking about trying to find uh, not only the current slope, which is what we've just been talking about, but also are we strengthening or weakening within that slope? And the analogy is this. And in fact, maybe it might actually in some ways help if I have an uptrending fork to be able to demonstrate it. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just see if I can find one that we've been using recently. Uh, most of them are downtrending forks, which is kind of telling, isn't it? Um, I tell you what, let's just use this one here. This is the British pound. Here's the analogy. One of the things that I always look for within a pitchfork, apart from knowing that we have the current slope of price, like this, is are we strengthening or weakening within that slope? And, and again, here is the analogy. For those of you that, uh, <laughs> for those of you that do uh, running or try to keep fit, if you have a treadmill or you go to the gym, once you start running on a treadmill, you start at the back of the treadmill. And we're going to assume that the lower parallel on the fork is the back of the treadmill. The treadmill rotates towards you, okay? So if you go no, if you do nothing, if you just stand on the treadmill, what's, what's going to happen? You're going to fly off the back of the treadmill. You're going to fall backwards off of the treadmill. So for you to move up within the treadmill, you have to expend energy. So you start running. And as you start running, you expend energy, okay? What you ideally want to be able to do is to get to the very front of the treadmill where the little LCD screen is that tells you how fast you're running, which in my case is not very fast. So you're trying to run to this point up here, but to do so, you have to expend energy. Now, what happens when you expend energy is you run out of breath. When you run out of breath, what do you do? Well, you pause. So using that analogy of the runner running on the treadmill, we start running. The runner starts running and makes it to here where the red arrow is, okay? That's where the runner has made it to and takes a breath. When he takes a breath, stops running, the treadmill does what? Pushes him back. He starts running once more from this point here, carries on running. Where does he make it to? Right back to here. He takes a breath. The treadmill pushes him back because he's taking a breather. He starts running once more. Where does he make it to? Right back to the same point again. Now, 
here's the thing to pay attention to. Most people, and when I say most, I don't mean 60% or 75%. I mean like 99.8% of people that look at a chart have an amazing flaw in, in my personal opinion, and I'm obviously incredibly biased. They look at the horizontal. It's all they look at is the horizontal. How many times have you seen vehicles, and especially gold and silver, put in a very slightly higher high, and the next thing it reverses and heads down by like three, four, five percent? It's because people are looking at the horizontal. If I draw in a horizontal line, in fact, let me take the other one out so we're not confused. Look at the horizontal line. I'm drawing it from the prior high. Now look, we put in a slightly higher high in this area here, then look what happens. So we put, this high here is at 51.88. This high here is at 52, let's call it 52. We're up by about like 12 or 14 pips. Look what happens, we reverse all the way straight back down. People that got long right here just got stopped out. They got long, making a new high, down it goes. So now the high is here at 52.03. People get long in this area here because they're looking at the horizontal. They're saying, oh, great, the pound's put in a new high. Let's get long. We've just gone up to 52.17. Lo and behold, it's up another 15 pips above the prior high. What happens? Down it goes. Stops out those people too. Here's the difference. Each of All of the people that trade the horizontal are looking at, let me try and get rid of some of these circles. They're looking at this high here, moving up to this high, this high moving up to this high, and they're saying the pound is putting higher and higher highs. This is wonderful. The pound is continuing to strengthen. Go back to the analogy. Remember the runner on the treadmill? Is this high lower than this high? Forget the little spike through the line. Let's, let's assume, just for, to, to be uh, in a hypothetical situation, all of these highs top precisely at the line. Let's be honest, that they're all not far from it. As far as we are concerned, the runner made it this far up the treadmill, okay? Next time, he made it the same distance up the treadmill. Took a breath. He made it the same distance up the treadmill. So are these higher highs? No, they're not. It sounds odd, and I'm glad I'm mentioning it now as opposed to on a Monday or a Thursday webinar or on a morning video because it will very much confuse you if, if you haven't heard me say this before. These three highs is a triple top. Now, try to imagine the chart with devoid of all of these lines. There are no lines on this chart. You're just simply looking at these three highs in isolation. If I told you that was a triple top, you'd think I cracked. You'd think that that's absolutely crazy to call these three a triple high. Can you see what I mean, though, when I say it's a triple high? The runner expending energy has run out of breath here and again here and again here. So it's a triple top. OK, let's look at when the runner took a breath and was pushed back. How far were they pushed back on the treadmill? Well, in this instance, they were pushed back. Let me try and get a circle. In the first instance, they were pushed back to the same level they had started running from previously. Now look at the third time. Now look at the fourth time. Can you see the consistency? Now, whether you want to call this a channel which is this, or not, it's up to you. We're going to talk about placement of the pitchfork and how we find the slope, but can you see how this is absolutely consistent? Can you also see that once you have the British pound moving into this area down here, we have a change, we have a change of behavior? It's not a big change of behavior, but it's a change of behavior. So the change in behavior is this. Our floor, and again, I'm, I'm always looking for what is the current ceiling, what is the current floor? The floor was here. That was our floor. That was the point at which the treadmill would push the runner, or me, or you, or whoever it is that's trying to, uh, that we're trying to chart, back to this particular level. Now look what happens. Can you see anything significant? Right in this area here, or in those three circles there, something absolutely major happens, and it's this. All of the support we were seeing along that line turns into resistance. Can you see that? Can you see how obvious it is now that the support that we had once, twice, three, four times, and right here we have a change in behavior. 
the floor on our treadmill effectively if, if you like the, the the place to which we were being pushed back to now becomes the furthest forward we can get on the treadmill we are now in a effectively we're in a, almost like a race for our lives we're being pushed right to the very back of the treadmill and if we're not careful we're going to get shoved off the back of the treadmill and you know what happens when that happens you go flying back across the room which is this Is anything about what I've just said in the last 10 minutes not clear? More to the point, is everything I've just said in the last 10 minutes clear? That what we're trying to find is, what is the current slope? And are we are we seeing a change either in strengthening or weakening within the slope? And, and just talking about generally when you see a higher high or a lower low on a downtrending fork, and by the way, everything I'm talking about now is exactly the same in, in uh, the inverse. Um, so Ken says, isn't the huge spike low ever, uh, sorry, the huge spike low more event based rather than a technical ph phenomenon? Well, Ken, I mean, that that's, you know, OK, l let me talk about this. So Ken is saying, I think, is this move to the downside not based upon something that happened? You know, for example, something happened in the UK or there's some piece of news came out. Absolutely, it is. It's absolutely based upon some event. But my point is, we were able to see straight even ahead of it that something was up. The British pound was trading below a level it should be trading at. Now, you might say, well, that's just an absolute coincidence that we happen to then get huge spikes to the downside. I don't. To me, this, I, I, and, and once you've seen this happen 50 times, 200 times, 500 times, I've done like 15,000 charts on this uh, website in the last three to five years. We have seen hundreds of times where we're able to see a change in behavior 24 hours prior to a big spike like this. Now, is it because it's coincidence? I don't believe that there's that many coincidences. I believe that it's more likely that the market senses something has changed. Now, maybe it's that whatever event occurred here leaked out. You know, heaven forbid news leaked out ahead of its official uh, release. My point, my point is what caused this is irrelevant. And I'll tell you how irrelevant it is. I have people say to me regularly, they'll say, oh, non-farm payrolls was this morning. Uh, did you see the Did you see the number? I haven't got a clue what the number is. I don't care what the number is. I don't want to see what the number is. I do not trade fundamentals on a 20 minute chart. And I personally believe that fundamentals have no place on a 20 minute chart. I believe that fundamentals belong on a daily and a weekly chart. Fundamentals will have an impact on the much larger picture. 20 minute uh, moves on a 20 minute chart have no relationship to fundamentals. It's purely about technicals. In my opinion, you may disagree. Think how many times GDP has come out in the US and it's dollar positive and the dollar moves up and all of the fundamentalists will say, well, there you go. That was a dollar positive piece of news and up goes the dollar. Told you fundamentals work. A month later, GDP comes out. George, you're saying I went mute. I don't think I did. No one else. I, I saw you go offline for a second, George. I think you actually had a bad connection there for a second. Uh, it, there will not be a mute uh, on, on the recording. So, OK, let's So the fundamentalists say, OK, GDP came out. It was dollar positive. Dollar goes up. There you go. Fundamentals work. What happens next month? GDP comes out. GDP comes out and it's dollar negative the dollar goes up again. And the fundamentalists all say, well, there you go. You buy the rumor and sell the news. So that's absolutely correct. It's dollar positive, but everyone bought before. So now they're selling. So to put it another way, you've got no way of being wrong. If it goes up, well, of course, it was dollar positive. If it goes down, well, yeah, everyone's selling the news. You can't lose. So I, I, I personally believe fundamentals have no place on a 20-minute chart. And the technicals absolutely will tell you what's going on ahead of the uh, curve. Now, so we've talked about a pitchfork. We've talked about, um, no problem, Ken. We've talked about looking for what I call a change in behavior. And I, I used a really kind of odd analogy in the middle of the week. Uh, I think it was actually on the Monday, maybe it was yesterday's webinar. I think it was on yesterday's webinar or maybe last Thursday. And what I said is this, we, we have a number of dogs. We've got three dogs. In fact, we're getting a fourth dog next week. So we've got a number of dogs and one particular dog, Toby, every single morning will come in, rest his chin on my knee and basically gaze up at me. And the message he's giving me is, I wanna go out, I'm gonna go out in the yard. So I let him out. Every single morning that happens. 
If on the morning he does not come down to me to do that, I detect that there's something has changed. Something's up. Something's not right. And I go looking for him. And in fact, I did happen one time and he was, he was quite sick. My point is, if something continues to happen, let's get, let's get rid of some of these circles for a second so I can show you something. If something happens in a regular basis, um, where are all these little circles? One second. Well, I'm struggling to find where these circles are. Anyway, if something happens in a, on a regular basis, support, resistance, resistance, support, resistance, support, resistance, resistance, support, support. Can you see how this, this is the equivalent of a dog resting its chin on your knee. This is the equivalent of something happening in a very habitual manner. So once this over here happens, it should be screaming at you, something has changed. And another analogy I used to give months and months and months ago, which is this. If I give you a sequence of numbers, and the sequence of numbers is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 704, that 704 should pretty much stick out at you and say, hang on, something just happened. Support, resistance, resistance, support, support, resistance, support. In this area here, you should at least be saying to yourself, something just happened. We just had a 704. Something just happened that had not happened previously. It's a change in behavior, and I am now paying attention to the British pound, potentially, for a move lower because of a change in behavior. Let's go back and look at placing a pitchfork and how we identify the slope. I, I, I'm hoping that a lot of this kind of makes sense to you. Let me just... Um, so just a refresh on this particular chart, pull in some more bars, and then we'll try and add some pitchforks. And it looks like the euro has locked. Uh, sorry, the ensign, uh, ensign has locked. Just give me one second. We'll give it a, a few minutes to sort of catch up. Here we go. So I'm just going to add some more bars into the chart. Wait for Ensign to catch up. OK. This is a fork that we have going all the way back to January the 1st, the very beginning of the year, 1st of January this year. And I've drawn in an Andrew's pitchfork. I just want to sh uh, spend one minute talking about the various different types of pitchfork that we use. Has anyone in here used pitchforks or median lines prior to looking at morning analysis? Has, has anyone got experience of using e e either uh, with someone else or yourself? No, nope. KD, no, nope. no problem. So look, there are three types of pitchfork that I use. The first is a regular Andrews pitchfork, and that's the one that you're, you're probably most familiar with. And I'm guessing that the um, most of your platforms will support that. So it's a regular pitchfork, which derives from three coordinates. And you'll hear me on the morning webinars and the first Monday and Thursday webinars talking about various components of the fork. I talk about the lower parallel, the upper parallel, and the median line. Now, some people will call for example, they will call this the lower uh, median line, this the upper median line. I do not. There is one median line, and it's the backbone or the spine of the fork. If you think about it, the very rationale as to why it's called a median line is that it's a line that is drawn from the A pivot through the median or middle of the BC line. And the very middle of the BC line is right there. So it's a line drawn from the A pivot through the middle of the BC, and that's the median line. What we're typically looking for, and, and don't get too hung up on this, because I think that a lot of people that use pitchforks make one fundamental mistake, and it's this. 
they consider that this has to be the floor and this has to be the ceiling and that's it as soon as price moves below the lower parallel they discard the fork saying well there you go that fork's not working anymore i'm going to discard it it's gone incorrect what we are looking for and I'll look at the other two variants of pitchfork in one, just one second. What we are looking for is once we have found a slope that is working, so that once we convince ourselves that we have a working slope, all we are looking for at that point is what is the current ceiling? What is the current floor? And that's it. Is the ceiling rising or falling? Is the floor rising or falling? If the ceiling falls, I probably expect the floor to fall. If the floor rises, I probably expect the ceiling to rise within this slope. And when I say within this slope, I don't mean within the upper parallel and lower parallel. I just mean with reference to this slope. So if you see price move up, come back down, come back up. What you'll notice is I will draw in sliding parallels. A sliding parallel is a line that is drawn parallel to the fork. And when I see resistance touching, as it does here, once, twice, three times, four times, I now consider that to be the ceiling. It doesn't need to be the median line. It doesn't need to be the upper parallel. I'm simply looking to see where the ceiling is. I'm happy to draw in a line below the fork. And if I see a bounce, a spike low, I'm happy to draw a sliding parallel from it. And as you can see, we have a bounce on the sliding parallel. So what that tells me is this slope continues to work. The fact that we're outside of the lower parallel, it almost means nothing to me. What would mean more to me is this. If we have a floor at the lower parallel, whoops, at the lower parallel, and it works several times, And then we see this. If I see that type of configuration, I'll draw in my sliding parallel. I'll see that we've got a constant ceiling up above. I'll see that we have a constant floor down below. So what have we had in this area here? And this is pretty much similar to what we had in the British pound. We have a change in behavior. I'll add in a sliding parallel to see if it's working. And it is. Well, that's great, you think. We've got a sliding parallel working below the fork. Our problem is that our floor has stepped down. Our floor has stepped down from the, sl the lower parallel here and here and here. And it's stepped down to here and here. So we've had a change in behavior. Let me just undelete that line. We've had a change in behavior. Let me go back to that fork, wherever it is. There it is. And once you've had a bearish change in behavior, and what I mean by a bearish change in behavior is this. Our floor has stepped down. Let me highlight. So our floor was previously at the lower parallel. That's where it was. And now it's stepped down to this line. If our floor steps down, I'm probably expecting our ceiling to step down. So if I got long, and there's no problem getting long here still, as long as you've got a sufficient risk reward of three to one or uh, three to one or more. But what it would mean is I'm much more cautious now. I am not, for example, looking to take profit up here. In fact, the first place I personally would now look to take profit, I would look to take some profit around here. Can you see why? The floor stepped down from this line to this line. So therefore, I'm on guard for the ceiling to potentially do the same thing and step down. And if this is a and if the ceiling could step down or will step down, then I would be drawing a sliding parallel from a prior high, which is exactly what this is. And that would be the first place I take some profit off the table. Now, it, it could absolutely be that the, within several hours, this vehicle shoots straight to the upside. I don't care. 
I'm, I'm playing the low risk approach and the low risk approach is I take some profit in this area here. There is another reason why this is a good place to take some profit. Let me draw a horizontal in. You remember I told you I don't look at the horizontal. I really do. It's most other people will. Most people will be focused on this level. And the reason is that was the prior high. As soon as price dips or pops up to this kind of level here, there's every chance you might see a reversal straight back to the downside. We have put in a fresh high. Breakout traders will be getting long in the wrong area and they'll be getting stopped out. Again, if, if, if any of that just doesn't make sense, tell me. Let me go back to talking about the fork variants. I kind of got like sidetracked there talking about some of the nuances. That was the Andrews pitchfork. The next one I want to talk about is what's called a modified shift. The A pivot is where the circle is. In fact, if I unshift this fork, I'm going to make it into a regular Andrews. You'll see the fork generated from these three pivots. OK, A, B, C. Within Ensign and maybe some of the platforms that you're using, you can actually hit a key on your keyboard and you can convert the fork from an Andrews fork into a modified shift. Let me do that now. That's now a modified shift pitchfork. What a modified shift does is this. It moves the A from where you've planted the fork effectively back here at 160.99. It moves it 50% of the way up towards the B price, which is here. So it moves the tail 50% up towards that. And then it moves it forward 50% of the way in time towards the B time. Let me get rid of some of these circles. So uh, another way of looking at it is this. If you draw a line from your A to your B, it will be 50% of the way along that line. Does that make sense? So if you're looking at a modified shift pitchfork, that's all it is. It's a, a pitchfork where the A has been moved 50% of the way from the A towards the B in a, in a straight line. And how it's used is quite often, if you've got three pivots, let's just say your three pivots are here, here, and here. That, I can tell you straight away, is going to give you a very steep pitchfork. Let's draw the pitchfork in. That's a very steep pitchfork. So what you can do is you can lessen the slope of the fork by making it a modified shift. And you can see that that's actually turned it into a less steep pitchfork. And you'll see a lot of the forks on the charts will be modified shifts. And typically, what I do is, if I'm using a modified shift, I'll make it purple in color. So you can pretty much tell it's a modified shift fork, or at least a shift of some form. I'm not going to go through the history of how we've ended up with a shift and a modified shift. Uh, there was a, a trader by the name of Jeremy Schiff who actually generated these derivatives of uh, Andrew's uh, pitchfork. But let me just talk you through the third variant. The third variant is a regular shift. It's not a modified shift, it's a regular shift. I'm gonna um, put that on right now. And you can see in Ensign, I have the ability to pick an Andrews, a shift, or a modified shift, and actually lots of other esoteric versions. These are the three that I use, Andrews, shift, and modified shift. I'll make it a shift. And what you can see immediately is that the fork is even less steep. OK, the difference is that the A pivot in the same way is moved up 50 percent of the way towards the B price here, but it is not moved forward in time by 50 percent of the way towards the B in time. So if I make it a modified shift, you'll see the tail pops forward 50 percent of the way in time towards the B. If I put it back to being a regular shift. You'll see the tail will pop back to being just above the A. There it is. Now, out of all the forks that I use on charts, I would suggest that probably 45 to 47 percent are Andrews, 45 to 47 percent are modified shift, and probably three to five percent are, 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 are regular shifts. So you'll find most of the forks that I'm using are Andrews and modified shift. Now, typically, the next question that someone comes out with is, well, hang on, how do I know which one to use? How do I know when to use an Andrews and when to use a modified shift and when to use a regular shift? And I guess 
the slightly odd answer I typically give in that uh, regard is this. If you go to a shoe shop and you buy shoes and they're too tight for you, you're not going to buy them. If you put the second pair on and they're too loose, you're not going to buy them. I mean, I hate to go back to the Goldilocks uh, analogy, but you're looking for the porridge that's just right. You're looking for the pitchfork that's just right. It fits. Let me give you an example. This is an Andrews pitchfork. We are looking to validate the slope. And what I mean by that is we're looking for evidence that the slope is active. Remember when we were talking about the ceiling and the floor? So how do we know that a fork is active? How do we know that this is the right fork? Well, it's pretty apparent. What you're looking for is you're looking for spike highs and lows, turns that respect the slope of the fork. It's that simple. Let me turn this fork. In fact, let me leave the fork as it is for a second. Can you see how, and let me get rid of some of these circles. This is me on another webinar talking about why I believe that this fork is actually active even before it really did much. Look at, I've drawn a, a, an Andrews pitchfork from this A up here down to B, C. But look in doing so how I capture all of, whoops, I don't capture anything now after I move the fork. Look how I capture highs all the way along the tail. Look at all of those touches along the tail that tell me that this slope looks pretty good. Let me get a sliding parallel from within the fork and move it up and see if we've got anything else. Look at this. Can you see how, and there's probably another one. Look at this one here. Can you see, and, and bear in mind, I'm not looking for surgical pip precision. I'm not looking for something to touch to the pip or I ignore it. If, you, if you're looking for that, you'll find forks that work, but you'll find a lot less of them. You have to kind of bear in mind when you've got volatile markets, you might see a couple of pips difference. So ideally, looking at this sliding parallel here, this is at 58.92. You'd really want it like about four pips lower for it to be a perfect touch. But look right here, more resistance. I'm just trying to find generally, do I have the right slope? Now let's go to within the fork. Do I have anything that tells me that this particular fork is working? Well, of course we do. We've got a pretty accurate um, rejection here towards the top of the fork, not quite at the upper parallel, which would have been up around 58, sort of 16. We turned from 58.05, yeah, about 10 pips away. So I'm not particularly mad about that. But what do I like is this. Look at this, bounce right here, a spike low, which drives higher. So at this point, the fork is on my radar. And what I typically say is when I have a fork that is pretty well validated, but I kind of maybe would want a little bit more, I typically just say it's on my radar. It, it's speculative. I'm kind of keeping an eye on it. I think that it's working. So let me drag the, uh, whoops, let me just refresh the chart. So now look what happens. We kind of like drive outside of the fork, go all the way back down again. But what I'm paying attention to is based upon this spike low here and this spike low here, I think that this slope is working. Let me zoom in on this area right here. Let me take some of these circles out just to make it a little clearer. So because just because of that and nothing else, I suspect that the fork is working. I'm trying to get rid of some of these circles. Um, One second. Well, I'm really not having a lot of luck today in removing circles, am I? Oh, it definitely wasn't those ones. There you go. I'm in the right area now. There they go. So look what happens. And I'm paying attention to this at the time. I'm looking at the fact that we've come up, a bit of resistance, and we drop. Come up, hit it a second time, and we pull away. I'm going to zoom in even further. Everything that I'm looking at here on the 15th of February is based upon this low here on the looks like the 1st of February and this low here on the 5th of February. 
those two lows have put the, the fork on my radar. So when we come up to this area here, that's what I'm paying attention to. So look what happens. We pop up, we have resistance and we fall away. So it's a key high because it's a key high. I'll draw a sliding parallel on the slope that we're watching. And once we drive back up to it, I'm watching to see, do we get more resistance at that line? And look what happens. We, we touch it with pretty, pretty reasonable precision. Let's get the circle out, uh, out of there. So we've now got one touch, two touches. This is from 5540. Down we go. We down, we go down basically 100 pips. And so as early as this area here, and you can see, I was saying, okay, we got one touch. We got a second touch. I'm looking, and that's what I drew in. I'm looking for a move up and a rejection, a third rejection from this line. We now have a slope that we believe is working. We have a proven line, which is what I'm really looking for. Within the slope, I'm looking for a proven line, a, a ceiling that I can trade. And as you've probably heard me say on the webinars, I will only trade downtrending forks to the downside and uptrending forks to the upside. So I'm trying to get short along this line. Well, unfortunately, the pound just drifted lower. Started to come back up. And what I said here was the same thing. You're looking for resistance along this line. And we came close. 5507 is where we went to. The line's at 5414. We went to within seven pips before again moving lower. Again, this is the place to look for resistance in the British pound. Now, if I zoom out, you can see how well that actually worked out. We actually came into that line early, Tuesday morning of the 19th of February, the way that I play an entry once I have a proven line is this. I'll take an entry just inside the line, probably somewhere around 5487 uh, is about where I'd be taking an entry, and I'd be putting my stop above the prior high. Prior high, whoops, let's put that back. 5847 is our entry, and I'm looking at taking a stop above prior high, which is around 5508. So you're looking at about 20 pip stop, and that 20 pip stop, and by the way, if you weren't trading early in the morning, let's just say you're, you're like me, you're on the east coast of uh, the US, and you don't get up to like maybe sort of like five, six o'clock in the morning. So you've seen the pound come up to this area, and it drops away, comes back up again. Here is another entry opportunity. This is at 10 o'clock in the morning, New York. So now how would you be playing this one? Well, it's the same thing. Your entry would be around 58.41, sorry, 54.81, and your stop would be above the prior high. So 81 up to 0405, again, about 23, 24 pips. So you're looking at about a 24 pip stop. But the line has been proven multiple times. You hit it once, twice, nearly three, four times, five times. So you know that A, you have a proven slope, B, you have a proven line. And from that particular level, sorry, I've just realized someone's typed. Oh, no, no, I thought someone had typed something in. Apologies. So from that level around 5480, uh, we obviously saw a pretty decent move to the downside. In fact, we saw a huge move to the downside from 5480. We've been down well, around in the 46s is it, or 40s, 48s. So we've been down massively. But my point is, and, and I'm not going to talk about like it managing every uh, part of the trade. What I'm really trying to talk through now today, again, is the basics. How do you identify a slope? How do you identify a place to get long or short? And how do you take that entry? And for me, the way I take an entry is by uh, placing the entry and then placing the stop above the prior high. By the way, just to roll forward, this is, do you remember, this is where we just took that entry back up in this area here. So our ceiling is here. This is our ceiling. If we go back to this line, we will be watching and we will be looking for an opportunity to take another entry. OK. Now, let me roll forward. Whoops. Right here. This was on the 5th of this month. This was on uh, Tuesday. In fact, another Tuesday, because the, the first one was all the way back here on the 19th of February. Now we've rolled forward. And again, I'd said, look for resistance along this particular line. We'd popped up early in the morning, around about four, four o'clock in the morning, hit the line, 
And so on my morning analysis that morning, I'd said, you're looking for a move back up into this line for resistance and play it to the uh, downside. British pound rose from 51.45 to 51.60, sorry, 51.61, is that 61? No, 51.81, apologies. The line is at 51.85, four pips away. That was the place to get short right there. The entry, you'd been playing inside the line, you may not have been filled. Again, you're looking at an 83 to 01. You're looking at about like 15, 20 pips of a stop. This one would have been tricky because we actually topped about three or four pips below the line. So trying to get actually filled would have been a little bit tricky there. But again, look what happened. That entry we just looked at was right here. That was up around 5180s. And again, we just fell, fell, fell. Now, think about what I was talking about at the beginning. You identify a slope, and then you identify a change in behavior. Where is our floor? I keep talking about the ceiling in this British pound. Where is the floor? Well, the floor is here, down at the very bottom of the fork. Remember the whole thing with the treadmill and the runner? So the British pound runs, 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 takes a bit of a breather. And the treadmill pushes the pound back up into this area here. And by the way, even that particular move up there, again, is hitting sliding parallel in line with the slope of the fork, here and here. So it's telling us throughout that this slope is absolutely active. But look what happens as we roll forward. Look at the floor, bottom of the fork, bottom of the fork. Now look, above the bottom of the fork, we have a change in behavior. Now look. We're here at the quartile. I haven't mentioned the quartiles. The quartiles are the little thin lines here that actually dissect the upper parallel from the median line and the lower parallel from the median line. There's the lower quartile. So you'll hear me talking about upper quartiles and lower quartiles. So where is the floor now? It's at the lower quartile. Where is it now? Lower quartile. And again, lower quartile. So do we have a change in behavior? Absolutely. The floor has risen from the bottom of the fork, which we were hitting here back around 21st of February, and then again around 24th of February. Now we have a gap. We call this a bullish gap. The, the reason it's called a bullish gap is you would expect the British pound now to go all the way back down to this kind of area here for a, a, a bottom. It didn't. It left a gap. That's the gap. It's a bullish gap. You'll hear me talk about bullish gaps and bearish gaps. That's what I'm talking about. If we go to a line for resistance and we pull back, hit it a second time, pull back, then we have a gap. That to me is a bearish gap and I'm expecting a move down. Once you have a proven slope. So again, what's happening now? We've gone from having a floor at the bottom of the fork, now we're at the lower quartile. We actually have a floor that is rising. So because of that, I'm a lot more wary at the ceiling, which is along here. I'm much more wary at the ceiling. Because the floor has risen, I'm expecting the ceiling to rise. And sure enough, British pound, once we breached this particular fork, just shot straight to the upside. Once we have a downtrending fork, and I'm going to have to wrap this up in a couple of minutes. Unfortunately, I have another webinar uh, at two o'clock. Once I see a downtrending fork breach, I look for two things. I look for the following. I look for, does the line that was resistance become, after a breach, support? In which case, I expect to move to the upside. Or... I simply draw in an uptrending fork looking to capture the move. And this was my attempt in the British pound to capture a move to the upside. Now, does anyone think that this particular fork did anything? I do. Look at the high here. Look at the high here and here. Double tap. So I would look for support at the bottom of the fork. That's where I'm looking for support along the, the, the lower parallel of the fork. So what happened? Well, we came down. So we saw a bit of a bounce. I mean, let's be, you know, nothing to get too excited about. We saw a bit of a bounce from 5090 up to about 5115, 5110. We saw like a 20 pip bounce. It really wasn't much of a bounce. So is there anything else significant to look at? Well, look what happened. We fell under the fork. Then look, it became resistance. So I've drawn in a sliding parallel from our spike low. Up we go. Where do we find resistance? 
once more at the lower parallel, once more at the lower parallel. I'm probably more bearish than bullish the British pound now because our, our uptrending fork has breached, plus it's become resistance. Add to that, we also have horizontal resistance, which as I said, I rarely look at it, but in this instance, it's pretty apparent. We've got a lot of horizontal resistance to add to the fact that our fork, which should have been support, was actually resistance. So I'm probably expecting a move lower rather than higher. And the last line in the sand I would watch in terms of support is right along this sliding parallel here, which is where we're struggling to stay aloft right now. We, we, we are still staying above the sliding parallel, but if we start pu uh, pulling down below that line, I'm drawing in downtrending fork. Right. Unfortunately, I need to wrap it up. I, I, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I I hope this was useful. I, I, I hope that you, you, you've shall we say, I hope that when you look at the webinars uh, over the rest of the week and that you look at the morning videos, that some of the terminology and some of the things I'm looking for will just become a little bit more apparent now. Are there any questions before I wrap it up? Everyone's been really quiet today. I just want to make sure everyone can. Uh... Oh, you're welcome, um, Fermin. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Uh, but no, you're, you're very welcome. Ken, you, you're very welcome. No problems whatsoever. Katie, no problems. So it sounds like everyone's happy. Um, so Maybe try and, try and look at some of the most recent webinars and sort of try and bear in mind what I've just been talking through. I, I've recorded this. I will get a recording posted to the site a little later on this afternoon. And once it's posted, I will pop into the chat room just to indicate that the, uh, the recording is online. If you've got any questions that have come out of this, just feel free to drop me an email. Um, but you, you've got some fundamentals there to work with. Identify your slope identify your current ceiling and floor, and identify any changes in behavior that tell you that something's amiss. A downtrending slope is maybe rolling back to the upside or vice versa. Good example here, this was downtrending fork in the Australian dollar. And we started looking at the fact that we started breaching that and moving sideways out of that particular fork. <clears throat> and once we started even breaching that fork, now I'm expecting a big rolling to the upside. It, it, in hindsight, it's incredibly obvious to, to expect that the, the Australian dollar was rolling to the upside, except it was right there that I posted it. Right there, I said I was expecting a move up in the Australian dollar because this channel to the downside, if I zoom in on that now, it breached here. And that's where I was paying attention to the Australian dollar and saying, I think that we're going to move to the upside because we have resistance, 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 resistance. Now, look, the line breaches and becomes support, support, support. Where are we going to go? Well, we're probably going to take a move to the upside. Change in behavior. We're expecting move up. And that was down in the 102.50 area. And uh, we've been up to 104. So about 160 pips. There you go, guys. I'm going to wrap it up for now. Any questions, drop me an email. I will uh, pop into the chat room just for like literally two minutes to see if there are any questions. Uh, but other than that, I'll talk to you all soon. Take care of yourselves, guys. Talk soon. Bye-bye.